Well, it's an interesting. That? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think they it is becoming more proletarianized everywhere in the sense that more and more people depend upon wage labor for much or most of their subsistence. Uh, the, they're also, that very process very often sets off uh, contradictions. Uh, one of which is that uh, there may not be continuous employment and you have to look for other kinds of ways of supplementing wage labor and the way in which you do this and the, and the different things that you combine to do it may make you, uh, you know, part-time fisherman, a horticulturalist, a uh, seller of lottery, as well as uh, a wage laborer. And um, so that, that's one thing. Where wage labor is carried out, whether it's in Port-au-Prince or in New York, or whether you uh, migrate you know, from one place to the other, uh, has puts you into different structures of labor. Um, so that that process of entering wage labor uh, doesn't have a un doesn't have uniform effects everywhere. And while it is I think it is a process that goes on, it, it varies greatly with regionally within islands and I think in from island to island. Well, definitionally, we are peripheral capitalist states, and the islands are integrated at different levels into international capital. This has produced um, two major effects. One is that the entire population becomes saturated with claims about the virtue of the high level of material welfare enjoyed by the advanced societies and the belief that individually, probably through education primarily, they as individuals can achieve this. So that there's a, been the tendency to, through that kind of impact which comes through films, through advertisements, through the variety of goods offered, through easy travel to the advanced societies, and through other media, you know, books, novels, comic strips, and so on. Um, to become immersed into that kind of culture and hence soften the class contradictions which would normally exist within the society. So that even the poorest of the poor have the hope that their children can probably step up through some ladder provided by the politicians, usually the educational one. The other aspect of this is that there are dependent um, capitalist classes within these territories which forge linkages with segments of international capital and also with the politicians to continue to maintain a system of exploitation within these territories um, which prevents the ordinary mass of the population from enjoying whatever benefits accrue to the country in terms of increased production and the rewards to increased production in these territories. So that um, Mass of the Caribbean people are blocked in that way. But increasingly in contemporary times, especially given the steady crisis in the international system, are finding channels for political protest. And this takes various forms, not only in the cultural aspects of music, but physical violence on the streets, mm -hmm. attempted revolutions, coups, and what have you in the area, as ways of to express their growing dissatisfaction. Um, with the, so that class analysis isn't, but unfortunately, give peripheral capitalist state. Um, class is, you know, class is not internally the power it should be because most of the strength of that class, the local class, comes from outside and is determined by segments of international capital. And uh, this, this doesn't help to sharpen the conflict enough within each territory for there to be, a, a, as yet, a common assault, both against those who dominate internally, as well as against imperialist powers who support um, this, this um, internal um, cla um, leading class group. Um, but I, I would say, you know, that class analysis 
is central to whatever happens in these countries. It accounts for the particular structure of power within it. The portrait of the typical West Indian man who has acquired overseas education and returns, joins the political arena and uses it as a means of accumulating capital for himself and to enjoy the sweets, indicate to you how his potential um, ability to challenge the system has been diverted by giving to him or allowing him to have material welfare goods. I think in that sense there, there's, there's a much greater unity at the top than at the bottom. Yes. In a sense you could almost shuffle people from the elites round any of the capitals in the Caribbean. In some senses they would all fit in. Yes. They all have the same kind of houses in the same kind of locations with the same kind of heavy guards. Uh, they're all using the same kind of automobiles, mm. the same kind of stereos. If they're reading at all, they're reading the same kinds of books. Um, there's a kind of coalescence of interest. As Neville was saying, uh, all of them dependent upon foreign capital in one way or another. But in a sense, because they're all dependent on foreign capital, they are all united. Uh, but at the bottom, there's an enormous heterogeneity. I think mm -hmm. what Eric uh, was saying, if you, as it were, translate that into more general mm -hmm. class terms, what is happening is that people are surviving by combining, in fact, a variety of class positions. It's not like the classical picture of a factory proletariat mm -hmm. that are united by the common experience of factory work. You've got someone who, uh, is a factory worker uh, for a little while and then has to go off and be a, uh, a street trader or lo a lottery ticket seller or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in fact, actually is moving from class to class in doing that. Again, there are other divisions which I think are very important and which I don't think we should leave out of this discussion. There is, of course, the, the ethnic distinction. And you know the relation of ethnicity to class is an enormously complex problem and creates tremendous variations within the same classes, for example. I mean, East Indian workers actually opposed to African workers of African descent and right. so on. The other division which I think is very important to bring in here is of course the, the, the gender division. Yes. The, the, the male and, and female question, because again, as with every other part of the world, uh, old uh, men like myself have now come to realize there are also women. Who uh, <laughs> are about 50% of the population and also have interests. And they can't be subsumed into class interests again. And the, many of the workers we're talking about, for example, are women who come into branch plants set up by uh, outside interests and uh, working as cheap labor, making garments or assembling electronic goods or whatever. Mm -hmm. And their interests are not necessarily identical with male members of the same class. So we have this enormous heterogeneity, diversity, conflict of interest, as it were at the base. And the problem, it seems to me, is if we want to organize the base to force the elite into some sort of changes that will benefit the mass of the population, give them the quite basic things like somewhere decent to live and, and yes. uh, reasonable health and food, as Neville was saying, uh, the problem then is how do you organize this very heterogeneous base? Sure, sure. So uh, we, we have uh, very, this can be, this organization uh, is definitely a process. And I think one, uh, and I think what we were, you were saying and Neville was saying, uh, bring us to a very interesting a contradiction, very interesting dialectic that the, the, the more heterogeneous class, in a way, the, this dominant class, is the one more interested in the division, uh, as, you were, as you were saying. Uh, so uh, the fight against this class uh, within a great diversity in the bottom, uh, then a fight against this class is, a, is a, in a way a step uh, towards a greater unity, and maybe in the process of in the, of, uh, of diverse struggles against uh, this uh, more homogeneous uh, class, but that uh, is uh, hindering the possibility of unity, uh, uh, create bases 
for for a possible unity within the diversity to begin to 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 bring again this uh, this concept. I hope I'm not implying that because I think it's that diversity that makes the Caribbean area, in my view, the most exciting place in the world to live. In spite of its poverty and in spite of its absence of political and economic integration, it is in fact, in my view, almost the only place in the world to live. The variety, the, the um, way in which we understand each other easily, although we come from varied traditions, the way in which we can find something of interest in salsa music and way in which the Spanish speakers find reggae quite interesting in itself, and the way in which all these can be internationalized. I mean, it makes this region the most exciting place to live, and I always feel first class wherever I go across the linguistic boundaries. Well, I was going to add something to this discussion. I think you also get alliances across classes. Yeah. Because people, for quite diverse motives, sometimes find themselves on the same side. And the, the issue of who controls the state and who has something to say about resources uh, affects both the bottom and the, and the, and the top. I mean, I, I, I was present once in Jamaica at a time when a group of American financiers came in to an to a office of a Jamaican official and who had some jurisdiction over land in Jamaica and they were going to buy the West Coast from him. You know, and, and that man came out of that discussion so humiliated and feeling so terrible uh, that I, you know, I could easily see him then taking a very different position and politically after that discussion and before the discussion. That must happen all the time. So there, there, there are cross-currents as well and, and, and cross-cutting alliances. It's following on very closely on that. In fact, the concern that I'm increasingly getting uh, uh, is with the role of those from the Caribbean who are now resident outside it. Yeah. You've had this tremendous spreading out. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes said, for example, that there are now more Surinamese living in the Netherlands than in Suriname. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but there is a very large transfer of population. Not in that case. And the transfer of the population to the USA, <laughs> to Britain, well, we're all very familiar with yes. this. And this has, this has a, of course, an enormous debilitating effect. One can see why it has to happen. Yes. People can't get jobs and a decent living in their own countries. They have to move out. But it's enormously debilitating because it's draining off yes. very often the most energetic and most educated, yes. most enterprising parts of the population are leaving the Caribbean. This is not to denigrate the people who stay behind because they very often maybe haven't got the chance to go. But nevertheless, uh, very important segments are being literally transferred outside. And it seems to me that there's an enormous responsibility on those people to look back to where they came from and in a sense to reinvest in where they came from and at least if they can't return to physically that is to become very much more involved in what is happening there because we began by talking about as it were how we would define the, the Caribbean there's one sense in which the Caribbean is now enormously expanded because the Caribbean is is also uh, all the people from the Caribbean living outside the yes. and they must I think I, I say this very much as a person who is not myself from the area looking at it from outside that there's an incredible responsibility on those people to to get themselves reinvolved in what is happening in the most direct way because that's an enormously important force for, for change and for, for, for dynamizing and uh, another thing to that is that uh, maybe these persons that were that are living out, outside they came from a small town from a village and now to uh, the, the the return in interest uh, uh, of knowing the place of, of 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 where they came from is not only of that village or that uh, or that small town but the Caribbean uh, since they are experiencing this uh, interrelationship uh, outside. So I would add 
what you were saying that uh, uh, and to the initial question that uh, there is a, a really a lot of potentiality in terms of the persons that are living outside of, of really helping us uh, defining the Caribbean. And basically, I think one of the major problems facing the Caribbean in the future has to do with our need to combat cultural imperialism, which has been deepened by the increase in the technical capability of delivering American programs directly via satellite and a dish into homes in every corner of the Caribbean in an unselected fashion. And that we have to find ways and means to to recapture our cultural sovereignty, to strengthen our nationalist spirit, to reduce the level of outward migration, and also to commit more people to the common good within our territories, and to find more practical ways to deal with economic imperialism within the region.